tragic death of Father John Kaiser on August 24th, 2000, came as a shock to all of those who knew him. Although he was an American citizen, Father Kaiser devoted his life to his parishioners, the people of Kenya, and to the teachings of the church. He was a humble and a honest man who provided spiritual guidance to those who needed it, spoke out for social justice for those who were maltreated, and who worked tirelessly to improve the lives of Kenya's rural poor. Was a tragic event which brought with it a great deal of controversy and speculation, particularly in view of the fact that Father John Kaiser was a well-known Catholic priest who was also a human rights activist. And in that regard, he was as it were a voice for the voiceless. The FBI and the Kenyan intelligence community ruled it a suicide. Was it? There were no signs of struggle. There were no footprints or other indications that others were present at the scene. All forensic analysis and findings are consistent with the conclusion that the FBI ultimately reached. All investigative results obtained by Kenyan authorities were then analyzed by the FBI investigators and as well by the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. Kenyan authorities conducted appropriate crime scene investigation. As you know, Dr. Olumbe the government pathologist for Kenya conducted the post-mortem examination, which was observed by forensic and senior officials representing the Catholic Mission, the United States Embassy, and Kenyan law enforcement, and pathology authorities. You also know that Dr. Olumbe concluded that the cause of death was a gunshot wound to the head. Additionally, the FBI sought out one of the world's leading experts on gunshot wound analysis to independently review this matter. All information known to the FBI was provided to Dr. Vincent J.M. DeMaio, Chief Medical Examiner for the Bear County, San Antonio, Texas Medical Examiner's Office. He is also a renowned author on the subject of gunshot wound analysis. The FBI and Dr. DeMaio reached independent and essentially identical conclusions concerning the manner and cause of Father Kaiser's death. The manner of Father Kaiser's death is most consistent with death resulting from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. The case of Father John Kaiser. On the morning of August 24, 2000, two brothers, John and Henry Canbo, set out for the market town of Naivasha to purchase cattle just before dawn. Despite being one of the busiest routes in the western Rift Valley region of Kenya, the Naivasha Nakuru Highway at 6 in the morning was desolate save for the old white Toyota truck resting on the edge of a ditch close to a grove of acacia trees. The brothers pulled over after spotting a body lying in a brick drainage culvert and a string of pink rosary beads dangling from a dashboard switch. The Canvas brothers could see the body of a giant white man, standing 6 feet 2 inches tall and weighing 200 pounds, in the early morning light. He was on his back, his gray pants and black leather jacket covered with dirt. A double-barreled shotgun was at his feet, and a stack of blankets and sheets was by his side where the back of his head ought to have been, blood gushed out. Police had no trouble recognizing the body when they arrived as it belonged to John Anthony Kaiser. Because of the efforts he made on behalf of the underprivileged and dispossessed, he enjoyed great popularity among Kenyans. He was a priest from the United States who had first visited Africa 36 years prior as a missionary soon after receiving his Episcopal ordination. 
Due to his physical power, the Kenyans initially called him Father Seven Oxen. However, due to his ferocity, persistence, and not a man to be crossed, they later began to refer to him as the Rhino. In the few years prior to his demise, he had established himself as the voice of the people, or the key, and he was unafraid to speak out against the corruption that afflicted the Kenyan government. At the time of his death, Father Kaiser was 67 years old, and the police reported that he had been shot in a gangland-style execution. He passed just five months after receiving the annual Human Rights Award from the Law Society of Kenya for being a study in courage, determination, and sacrifice on behalf of the weak, oppressed, and downtrodden. Kaiser testified in public before the Akiwumi Commission in 1999 regarding tribal clashes leading up to the 1997 general elections, and at the time of his death, he was carrying papers he was going to hand over to the commission, additionally, he had a three-week trial date to testify against the government before the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Moreover, Florence Paiai, whom Kaiser had been assisting in seeking retribution against a politician who had sexually assaulted her, withdrew the rape lawsuit less than a week after Kaiser's passing. <laughs> He served the poor, advocated for justice, for the oppressed, and respect for human rights. This is a simple man, a man of God, and he was being murdered for what he stood for. So he's certainly a, a political murder. Father Kaiser had long been a sore spot for the administration, which attempted to deport him in November 1999 under the pretext that his work permit had run out. Kaiser briefly hid in Kisi before the U.S. Ambassador Johnny Carson and Bishop Colin Davis of Ngong intervened and secured him a fresh work permit. Kaiser had been followed, frustrated, and even physically assaulted by Kenyan police in the Criminal Investigation Department and even placed under house arrest throughout the 1990s. Before venturing deeper into the case it is worth mentioning the fateful odyssey of Bishop Muge. At the height of the call for the introduction of multi-party democracy, Alexander Kipsang Muge, an Anglican bishop, was a marked man and a pain in the government's side before Kaiser. Along with Bishop Henry Okulu, David Jatari, and Reverend Dr. Timothy Njoya, Bishop Muge was in the vanguard of the reform movement. Peter Okondo, a loud and ardent supporter of the one-party regime, had warned at a rally three days prior to Bishop Mugi's passing that the bishop might not leave alive if he visited Okondo's constituency, Bija. Bishop Muge, however, disregarded the warnings and proceeded to Bija on August 14, 1990, for a crusade, but he was killed in an unresolved car accident on his way back. Kaiser lived with his parents on a dairy farm in northern Minnesota not far from the town of Purim before setting out for Kenya. Despite their financial difficulties, the family was resourceful. The four Kaiser youngsters manufactured their own toys and farmed their own veggies. When Kaiser was a little child, he learned to hunt and fish, which was a useful skill for the grueling life of a missionary. According to Michaela Dostiel, Kaiser's cousin, John never had comfort nor desire for it. At the age of 13, Kaiser moved away from the farm to attend St. John's Preparatory School, a Catholic boarding school 200 miles away in Collegeville, Minnesota. Despite the significant sacrifices required, his parents had a strong conviction that their children should get a Catholic education. He achieved the school record for pole vaulting, served as captain of the football and track teams, and excelled academically and as an accomplished artist. Kaiser Mahoney's sister, Carolita Mahoney, describes him as a typical kid with extraordinary talents. Everywhere he went, he attracted attention. But he lived alone and would have preferred to be out in the woods on a hunting trip. In 1951, Kaiser enrolled at St. John's University in Collegeville with the goal of majoring in English literature and pursuing a career as a teacher. But even then, he had an unsettling feeling that his future would be very different. Kaiser, a devoted Catholic, could not ignore God's calling. But his sister claims that because Kaiser loved women, being a priest was a tremendous sacrifice for him. In 1954, Kaiser graduated from college and joined the army during peacetime, serving three years as a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division. 
he slept in the woods, jumped off of aircraft, and acquired a craving for adventure that he didn't think a parish priest could fulfill. The St. Joseph's Missionary Society's Dutch priest made a recruitment visit to the college not long after Kaiser returned to St. John's in 1957. It is the largest of the missionary orders and is most usually referred to as Mill Hill after its headquarters in England. Father Bill Voss, a classmate of Kaiser's at St. John's who later served with Kaiser in Kenya, recalls that the recruiter talked about the wildlife of Africa. That struck John. Kaiser was later sent by Mill Hill to SLU in St. Louis to start his seminary studies. He graduated in 1960 and continued his education in England, but he insisted on coming back to St. Louis for his ordination in 1964. He boarded a freighter that autumn and set off on the two-month journey to Kenya. Two FBI agents visited Carolita Mahoney's home in Underwood, Minnesota, on the afternoon of April 18, 2001. Johnny Carson, the American ambassador to Kenya, had made arrangements for the FBI to join the CID and Kenyan police in the inquiry as soon as Father John Kaiser passed away. Carson was concerned that the Kenyans would try to defend President Mui by attempting to conceal Kaiser's murder as a political assassination. Mahoney worked with the agents, providing them with all the information she had regarding her brother's life. She yearned for justice and a conclusion. They delivered her an 81-page report titled The Final Report into the Death of Father John Kaiser following an eight-month investigation. She took the document and flipped to the last summary page. She observed that the agents left the room without waiting to observe her response and left so fast, as if sensing her impending unhappiness. The study stated that Father John Anthony Kaiser's death was more likely to have been a suicide than a homicide. A self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head caused the suicide. The final 96 hours of his life in Nairobi were the focus of the FBI report. Colleagues reportedly described him as haunted, out of sorts, tense, scared, and exceptionally nervous. When Father Kaiser did finally fall asleep, Father Kaiser could be heard calling out the names of prominent Kenyan politicians. He was observed crying at mass and spent nights awake with a shotgun at his side. He confided that he believed he was being followed, according to the report. It is alleged that he told his bishop that death was near. Carolita Mahoney was astonished and enraged as she stood in the doorway. Devout Catholics, especially Catholic priests, did not commit suicide and according to her everyone who knew John would understand how absurd the report was. Kaiser had an inkling that he might be murdered and that someone would try to cover it up because he had witnessed it happen before when other priests were killed and their deaths were falsely attributed to tragic automobile accidents. In an open letter to his family and friends that he sent just before he passed away, he stated, I want all to know that if I disappear from the scene, because the bush is vast and hyenas are many, that I am not planning any accident, nor, God forbid, any self-destruction. Kaiser's family understood the FBI's conclusions implications right away. Suicide was a deadly sin and went against everything Kaiser as a Catholic priest stood for. Weaver explains, it was a smear on his name. Mahoney disagreed with the report's conclusion, despite the FBI's convincing assertion that Father Kaiser's suicide was motivated by his unstable mental state. Uh, first, I want to make it clear that uh, the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime Behavioral Analysis Unit did not come over here to do a post-mortem psychiatric evaluation of Father Kaiser. Uh, rather, because of our law enforcement experience, we bring something to the behavioral table that most psychiatrists don't, which is that we go to crime scenes and we've worked homicide, plenty, hundreds of homicide investigations every year. So naturally, in the course of our looking at this case, we were trying to determine, um, first of all, was this a homicide or was this a suicide? And I think as you can see in this report, we have listed out factors that are consistent with both of those. As to why this, why Father Kaiser uh, committed suicide, I think there will be a lot of speculation. 
uh, certainly those closest to him may be in a better position to comment on that uh, than we. Uh, however, I think if you read the report and you see some of the stressors that were evident in his life, you may be able to come to some of your own conclusions. I certainly think that you cannot dismiss one of the most significant factors, which is his previous diagnosis uh, by uh, physicians on different occasions of having uh, an illness called uh, uh, manic depression, which is a biological illness uh, treatable uh, with lithium if you're taking that medication. There was no indication he was taking that medication. Um, we know historically uh, the, the, that uh, disease runs in a family and that it's uh, genetic and biologically based. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, that uh, we believe uh, certainly impacted on his uh, judgment and may have impaired that compared with or in, in concert with other environmental stressors that he was experiencing. Father Kaiser alleged that President Mui was the one who instigated the Maasai and Kikuyu tribe conflict. Following the Maasai's approval of Kikuyus residing on their land, the two tribes were coexisting amicably. However, knowing that Kikuyu people would not support him in the upcoming general election, 1992, and wanting to seize the land that had been granted to Kikuyu people, he sent thugs to attack them. In order to give the impression that the Maasai were the ones who assaulted the Kikuyu people, Father Kaiser thought more recruited gangster attackers to target the Kikuyu. To expel the Kikuyu from their territory was their goal. Following the 1992 general election, over 30,000 Kikuyu people were forced to leave their houses on Maasai territory and were forced to live as squatters in appalling conditions at Mela's camp. The UN's ratio wasn't enough, so Father Kaiser would fill his van with food like soybeans and maize. Kaiser requested the UN to take action to better the living conditions of the squatters at Mela's camp, but nothing was done. This prompted him to bring the issue to the limelight through the media. His issues with the Mui administration started at this point. The miserable living conditions of the squatters were made known to the world community. We had a gunshot somewhere there down. And by such thing, we get some stressed. We might be attacked or not. I have some four to five children here in the tent. Now it's hard, how can I learn with the children? And yet I'm trying to learn for myself. So we just ask the government to be to take a measure to, to make us, I mean to, I mean to protect us from all any aid or any attack. As a result, Kenya's government stopped receiving foreign aid. Mui consequently closed the camp. After Mela camp was shut, Father Kaiser provided housing in his church for kids and parents. To stop the soldiers from entering and removing the remaining squatters, he stood at the door which agitated the soldiers who punished him by being beaten and abandoned to perish in a bush but survived. On July 1, 1998, President Mui appointed a judicial commission of inquiry to investigate ethnic conflict in Kenya, including that which occurred in the Rift Valley in 1992 and 1997, the Coast Province in 1997, and the areas of Molo and Laikipia in 1998. The Akiwumi Commission, also known as the Commission on Ethnic Clashes, was tasked with determining the initial, immediate, and underlying causes of the violence. It would also look into how prepared law enforcement officials were to stop the clashes and what actions they took during the clashes. Any individuals who may have committed offenses relating to the conflicts were subject to additional criminal investigations and possible prosecution, as per the commission. A court of appeal judge Akiolano Akiwomi was appointed to chair the commission. President Mui replaced John Naga Gassavi, the commission's aggressive prosecutor, with Bernard Chuna, the deputy attorney general, who was apparently more pro-government, in late 1998, midway through its term. This alteration apparently led to complaints by the Catholic Justice and Peace Commission that it was being prevented from testifying and the commission being less vigorous in calling witnesses to testify about the role of government officials. Father Kaiser gave a public testimony before the Akiwumi Commission on Tribal Clashes in the run-up to the 1997 general elections, and when he died he was carrying documents he intended to present to the Akiwumi Commission. He was also set to testify against the government before the International Criminal Court in The Hague in three weeks. 
In his testimony Father Kaiser laid the blame for the violence between Maasai and Kikuyu and the closing of the Mela camp on Mui's officials, including the president. However, his claims were rejected by the commission. Kaiser's evidence was thrown out of the record by the Akiwomi Commission. Kaiser had discovered a new crusade in the meanwhile. According to two girls in his parish, Julius Sung Kuli, who was the defense minister at the time, sexually assaulted and pregnant them. Kaiser urged them to file a lawsuit against the minister. Kaiser was now aware that his life was actually in danger. A sympathetic government security officer informed him that assassination plots had been established. In 2003, an investigation into Father Kaiser's murder got underway. More than 100 witnesses gave testimony during the investigation, which continued until 2007. Magistrate Maureen Ottera issued three summons to the FBI, but they never showed up in court. The inquest reached the conclusion that Father Kaiser was murdered elsewhere and his body dumped where the butcher discovered it. The magistrate was adamant in her conclusion that Father Kaiser had been murdered elsewhere and dumped at the spot where the Canbo brothers had discovered it. The body of Kaiser underwent autopsy by two pathologists. The church and the human rights organization both signed up for one. The doctors concluded that the distance at which the bullet entered his skull through the right ear disqualified him from committing suicide. The family and the Catholic Church hired a lawyer, Buthi Gathenji who noticed that the pellets and wadding that Father Kaiser's shotgun would have fired when he was killed were crucially absent from the site where his body was found. It should also be added that the two mentioned above were not discovered in his skull's cadaver nor in the surrounding region, including neighboring shrubs. The inquiry states clearly that Father Kaiser was murdered. That means the theory of suicide was ruled out. What caused the FBI to reach the contrary conclusion about Father Kaiser's death that he committed suicide instead of the inquest's finding that he was killed? Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Your support means the world to us. Thank you.